Aloha. Welcome, everyone, to Church of the Holy Cross, United Church of Christ, on this Sunday morning for this time of worship. Now, I hope that you will notice that the screen is a little brighter here in the sanctuary. And in fact, it's also just a little bit easier to read in addition to the brightness. So, with any luck, that will be a, a a, a better resource to enhance our worship. And if you are worshiping with us via the live stream, well, uh, we are still able to take the pictures that we're showing here in the sanctuary and share them with you as well. Although for a moment this morning, we weren't sure that was gonna happen. <laughs> so we are grateful to be here one and all. Friends, this is the time. Why? Because it is the time we have made. This is the place. Why? Because it is the place that we have made. But there are other places and there are other times which are also suitable to worship God. Why? Because all times and all places are suitable for the worship of the one who made all the universe and all time. So in this one, let us worship God.
The Lord rules the earth. Let the planet rejoice. Let the coasts be glad. God's lightnings light the world. The earth trembles before God's glory. The mountains hear God's voice from Mauna Loa to Mount Zion. The villages rejoice from Judah to Hawaii. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks to the holy name of God. Please join me in the invocation. Come to us, Alpha and Omega. Come to us, you are the beginning and the end. May we be blessed as we shed the weight of sin on our lives. May we be blessed as we come to the tree of life. Let the Spirit summon us to you with our needs and our thirsts and our love. Come soon to us, Lord Jesus, and give your grace to your saints. Amen. to join me down front. Good morning, good morning. All right. You know about the EEV, right? Up there in the Ophir Forest? 
Sometimes, I'm sorry to say, any Evie can become something of a bully. Oh, I know, I know. Um, strangely enough, people sometimes are bullies too. Notice that? Yeah, okay. Well, sometimes an Evie becomes a bully. Usually it's not so bad, you know, the e Evie will, will chase you away if you're too close to the nest, or the e Evie will chase you away if there's a tree full of ohia flowers that he thinks he ought to be eating. But there was this one e Evie, I'm very sorry to say, he would chase you away from just about anything. If the tree was full of flowers, chase you away. If the tree just had a few flowers, chase you away. If you were just flying by the tree that he happened to be sitting in, he'd chase you away. That is, if you weren't an Eevee, if you were an Apapane, or an Amakihi, or an Akepa, he'd chase you away. So there was this little flock of Apapane, and a couple of Amakihi, and a couple of Akepa, in a tree with very few ohia blossoms, and they were all kind of sad and glum, and also thinking they were on the edge of being rather hungry. And they couldn't think of anything to do. They knew something had to be done, but what to do, what to do. Finally, one Amakiki had an idea. And she told them about the idea. And you know, there was somebody in the group, it happened to be an Apapani, but there was somebody in the group who said, oh, that will never work. Now sometimes that ends things right there, but she said, you know, if it doesn't work, we're no worse off than we are now. And if it does work, well, things will be a lot better. So despite the grumbling, the birds set out to put her idea into practice. So they found our bully, E. Evie. He was sitting in an ohia tree that had lots and lots of blossoms on it. And the Amakihi and a couple of other Amakihi sort of flew by the tree and when they did, of course, he took off to chase them away. What he didn't notice was that when he left the tree, a flock of Apapane and Amakihi and Akepa flew in behind him and started to feed on the nectar. He came back and found the tree filled with birds and he started to try to chase them away, but it turns out that it was a lot more difficult because now they could hide in the branches. Now there were a group of them, and when he flew at them with his wings, they would have three or four sets of wings to flap back at him. And while he was all busy with this, he didn't notice that those three Amakihi that had distracted him in the first place, they came back on the other side of the tree, and now they could have their breakfast too. Eventually, the Eevee gave up and flew off to find another tree. Well, I've got to hand it to you, said the Apapane, who, uh, who didn't think it would work. I didn't think it would work. The Amakihi said, this is something uh, that my grandmother said to me. She said, there's always something you can do. It might not work, but there's always something you can do. And when it works, it works. There's always something you can do. That is my story for you this morning. Thank you so much for coming up and listening.
Our first scripture this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Our second scripture is from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 20 through 26, part of Jesus' prayer in the garden. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. It is Memorial Day weekend. This is the first Memorial Day in quite some time that the United States has not been directly engaged in an armed conflict. In fact, 21 years since Memorial Day of 2001. So it is a day to remember the 2,420 American service members who died in the Afghanistan conflict. 
and of course to honor those who perished in the other conflicts of American history. It is a day to remember and to grieve. Unfortunately, it is also a day to remember and to grieve for those slain at the top supermarket in Buffalo, New York, people killed by a white supremacist because they were black. That was just 15 days ago. It is a day to remember and to grieve for Dr. John Cheng, killed by a politically motivated gunman in a Taiwanese language church in Laguna Woods, California. It is a day to remember and to grieve for 19 children and two teachers gunned down by an 18-year-old with an AR-15 in Uvalde, Texas, this past Tuesday. It is a day to remember and to grieve. It is a day to remember what else Jesus said to us in that upper room during that Last Supper, before he prayed the prayer whose conclusion you've just heard. In John 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And the next verse, John 15, verse 13, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. In these last few bloody days, we have heard about people who lived and who died that truth. They laid down their lives for friends, for students, for strangers. Aaron Salter in Buffalo, Dr. Chang in Laguna Woods, Teachers Irma Garcia and Eva Mireles in Uvalde, it is a day to remember and to grieve. And it is also a day to remember Jesus' commandment and to renew our resolve to live in love for one another. And that means, among other things, we have to confront this rising tide of violence, of gun violence, in the United States. We have to confront the worship of the gun. It is 277 and a half miles from Uvalde, Texas, to the city of Houston where the annual convention of the National Rifle Association has been underway since Friday. As part of that event, they have invited pastors to pray in blessing of their gathering and of their membership. That's all well and good. But they have also been praying for the unrestrained power to hold other people's lives in their hands. They have been praying that guns and ammunition will be easily obtained. They have been praying that the instruments of slaughter will be nearby when someone is determined on slaughter. And that, my friends, is not love one another as I have loved you. Jesus was arrested the same night he prayed this prayer, and he did not lead an armed resistance when he was arrested. Instead, he ordered an armed disciple to put his sword back in its sheath. Now, I don't use this word often, and I don't use it lightly, but the prayer to be armed and dangerous and deadly is blasphemy. When Jesus prayed that they may all be one, 
he did not mean that they may all be ready to kill. He meant, may they all be ready to love. See, the unity of Jesus' prayer is not just any unity. It's a unity of love, a unity of compassion, a unity of grace. As Meta Stamper writes at Working Preacher, the oneness of the Father and Jesus is synonymous with love in John. And what the world is to see in our display of that oneness is the love of God miraculously made manifest. Our love for God and one another becomes then an offering in and for the world to experience the love through which all creation has come into being. Now maybe I'm naive, but I'd have thought it obvious that the commandment to love would imply don't kill people because they're black. Don't kill people because they're from Taiwan. Don't kill people because you're angry and frustrated. Is it not obvious? Well, some statistics from the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Each day, in the United States, not each year, not each month, each day, 321 people are shot. 111 of them die. 42 die from homicide, 65 are suicide. Access to a gun in the home increases the risk of death by suicide by 300%. For those of you for whom the percentage math is a little weird, 300% is four times the likelihood. Every 16 hours, more than once a day, a woman is shot dead by her current or former partner. Americans kill each other with guns at 25 times the rate of other high-income countries. Now the mass shootings grab the headlines. But most of those who die each day are lost one at a time. Most of them die by their own hand. Quite simply, one of the most effective ways to prevent death by suicide is to make sure there's not a gun available. Why focus on the guns? Because it turns out guns are tools and they're designed to do a job. The job they're designed to do is to take life. That's why hunters use guns more often than bows, because guns do the job better. And they do the job better on human beings as well as on animals. Ten years ago, the killer at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, fired 155 shots to claim the lives of six educators and 20 children. He fired those 155 shots in five minutes. So what are we to do? I suppose we could follow the advice of Texas's Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, he suggested that schools be limited to a single entrance. But you know, children are actually at higher risk from fire than gunfire. 
So let's pass over that particular suggestion. We could follow the advice of a raft of people who think teachers should be armed. Oddly enough, the people who mostly reject that idea are teachers. Lauren Castine, who teaches high school in Durham, North Carolina, wrote in a widely shared Facebook post this week, well, I'll tell you what won't help. One, thoughts and prayers. Two, increased policing in our schools. School resource officers and border patrol responded to the Evalde school shooting and it didn't prevent loss of life. And three, arming teachers. She notes, I trip over air. You don't want me to have a gun. Okay, so what will help? According to reporting by NPR's Nell Greenfield Boyce, research favors two actions immediately. To quote her story, one was a requirement that a gun purchaser go through a licensing process. A licensing process requires someone to, you know, directly apply and engage with law enforcement. Sometimes there's safety training and other requirements, says Daniel Webster of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions. Another approach that seemed to reduce deaths from mass shootings was state bans on buying large capacity magazines or ammunition feeding devices for semi-automatic weapons. Magazines like those used at Sandy Hook and in Las Vegas. Further, NPR reporters Jeffrey Pierce and Corey Turner write, a lot of the conversation around making schools safer has centered on hardening the schools by adding police officers and metal detectors. But experts say schools should actually focus on softening to support the social and emotional needs of students. Our first preventative strategy should be to make sure kids are respected, that they feel connected and belong in schools, says Otis Johnson, Jr. of Johns Hopkins University Center for Safe and Healthy Schools. That means building kids' skills around conflict resolution, stress management, and empathy for their fellow classmates. Skills that can help reduce all sorts of unwanted behaviors, including fighting and bullying. You know, that, that sounds a bit, just, just a bit, like love one another as I have loved you. Reducing gun violence and its oh so effective harm is in part about reducing the number of guns in people's homes and hands. Just Thursday night, three people were shot and hospitalized in a single incident in Honolulu. And the current suspect, I say current because he's the second one, he's also 18 years old. Without a gun, there'd have been a conflict. But without a gun, there'd have been less potential for severe injury and for death. Oh, and <laughs> last night, one was killed and seven wounded in Taft, Oklahoma. Oh, and last night, six were shot and injured in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Reducing access to the high capacity magazines, reducing easy access to that easy tool that makes it easy to kill and maim, that makes a difference. It's made a difference in other nations around the world. 
You know what Canada and Japan require of gun owners before they can buy the gun? They have to buy the safe gun storage solution. They have to demonstrate they can lock the thing away. In the United States, well, some states require it, but there is no federal law requiring safe storage of guns. There isn't even a federal standard for a gun lock. Reducing violence is also about developing those skills that are sneered at by those who espouse aggression as the proper way to deal with life and people. Conflict resolution, negotiation, managing disappointment, encouraging empathy and compassion, rewarding the behaviors that build other people up, discouraging the behaviors that tear other people down. I don't know. Shorter way to say that might be love one another as I have loved you. It is a long-term effort. <laughs> to give you an idea of just how long-term, um, Jesus gave us that commandment almost 2,000 years ago. And, uh, well, we haven't lived up to it yet. Now, have we? So reducing easy access to death-dealing firearms has got to be a part of the mix. Nothing is an absolute solution to gun violence, but I am in a place where I really do want to make it harder for people to kill. I'm not asking for absolutes yet. But for God's sake, can we make it harder to take a life? In 2020, in 2020, the leading cause of death for children in the United States, for the first time, was firearms. before that car accident. Is this the world we want to live in? Is this the world in which we love one another as I have loved you? No. It's time to lay down the swords. It's time to beat the spears into plowshares. It's time to lay aside the guns. Only that way may we all be one. Amen. In your prayers this morning, as well as all those folks at a distance, who need God's help in healing and in grieving. Remember the family of Herb Watanabe. We honored his life yesterday. Let us pray. Oh God of love, we have not been all that good at unity over the centuries. We have not been good at holding together when we disagreed. We have not been good at holding together when resources were tight. We have not been good at holding together in love. We have not been good at sharing Jesus' love. Forgive us, O oh God, according to the measure of our repentance. We ask your great arms to warmly welcome those whom we have lost to gunfire this week, the children of Uvalde and the children who have lost their lives in tragedies with fewer victims 
but just as much anguish to the families and friends. We pray for little children and for kupuna children, for, in the, for adults in the middle of their working lives and those just taking on the responsibilities of adulthood. Show them what love is, O oh God. Show it to those who've been sent to you because we could not love them better. Forgive us, O oh God, according to the measure of our repentance. We pray for those struggling to survive in war zones, for those infected by COVID-19, for those who live without a roof beneath the sky, for those wondering what the source will be for their next meal. We pray for the family of her Watanabe. We grieve for his loss. We ask that your blessing be with all those who mourn today. Strengthen us for our daily tasks, O oh God, for the things that we make and the things that we choose. Give us wisdom for our daily choices, O oh God, for the things we create and the things that we do. Give us love to share in our daily lives, O oh God, with those close by and with those far away. May we all be one in love. Hear our prayers of God in the name of Jesus, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus is with us through the busyness of our days. Jesus is with us through the quiet of our night. We pass along the presence of Jesus and the love of Jesus whenever we extend ourselves in aid to one another. Whether you share your gift here in the church today, through a gift online, or via an envelope in the mail, you are sharing the love of God. Let the offering now be received.
please join me in the offertory prayer. We offer you these gifts, O God, as your people, as the people of Jesus. Accept them, we pray, and through them make your love and care known in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Time to stand up and move again. <laughs> for spending this hour in worship in this place and time, whatever it may be where you are. I do want to mention that, that uh, we do not have a song from Church of the Holy Cross streaming this Wednesday. Ordinarily we would, uh, but unfortunately I've been asked to officiate in another service at that time, and so I won't be able to be in two places at the same time. I'm sorry, I've been working on this for 30 odd years in the ministry and I haven't got it right yet. Um, however, you will find a listing of lots of times to play pickleball <laughs> during the week. And uh, also just to let members of the stewardship and mission committee know that uh, their meeting is not happening uh, this afternoon, but later on this week, and you will get more information about that. Oh, friends.
I, I am accustomed as a pastor to repeating myself. I mean, when I was a father and a pastor, it was even more often, but... The simple truth is, we've been saying the same thing for 2,000 years. Love one another. We haven't got it right yet. Friends, keep at it. And don't let the fears and the follies of this world prevent you from the next effort. You can always do something. It might not work, but when it does, oh, it's a wonder. Love one another as Christ has loved you. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.